Last week, European brand Dacia unveiled the refresh of its Dacia Spring EV, a car that seemingly bucks the trend of most electric cars on the market today and packs just enough specs to be a practical everyday vehicle that weighs less than one metric ton, 2,200 pounds, seats for, and most importantly, doesn't break the bank. And along with that refresh, Dacia confirmed that the Spring EV will be offered for sale for the first time in a right-hand drive market, the UK, with an expected starting price of somewhere between £16,000 and £17,000 sterling, including purchase taxes of 20%. If we remove the included value-added tax and convert it to freedom dollars, that's about US$16,000 at the low end, a price which is far below anything on the market in North America today. And given that the US market is so desperate for more affordable EVs, especially at a time when automakers are complaining about the costs associated with building and developing EVs, we have to ask, why is it that the US and to some extent Canada is seemingly against small, low-cost EVs? The answer might shock you. If you live in or have spent any time in Europe, you'll know that the electric vehicle market there is very different from the US. For the most part, electric hatchbacks are still available and sold alongside larger electric SUVs. The Volkswagen ID3, for example, has become a common sight in many large cities around Europe, while all the models like the E-Up are still very popular with used car buyers wanting something practical, small and low cost to get around in. Station wagons are also a thing. They're just usually called estate cars or just wagons. And there's quite the breadth of choice in terms of pricing and specs. Of course, Teslas are there too. The Tesla Model 3 and Model Y also sell very well in Europe, and Tesla Model Ys are made at Tesla's Giga Berlin. But in addition to all of those models, there are also some more affordable options like the BYD Dolphin and the MG4 EV, as well as more city-focused models like the Notacar that's the Citroën Ami, or its siblings the Opel Rock or Fiat Topolino. Basically, if you're in the market for a new EV in Europe, there are plenty of choices that won't break the bank. So why not here in North America? Well, we've covered some of the reasons before on this channel, uh, link below, why the European and Chinese market EVs aren't automatically imported to the US. It's down to politics, not as you might assume, quote unquote, safety. Uh, we are re-examining things today with a slightly different angle. And the too long didn't read here is that Americans, and to some extent, but less so, Canadians, have been conditioned to assume a whole bunch of things about cars and then, by consequence, EVs. And many of those assumptions are they're wrong. So today I'm going to go through them, dispel some of the associated myths and see where we lie. I guess though at this point, before I go any further, I should reiterate something because I know these videos often tend to get picked up by people who aren't subscribers and may not even know who I am. And if you hear a British person talking smack about the US without providing context, you are bound to start telling me to either go back to where I came from or tell me to stop talking about the US market because I clearly know nothing, Jon Snow. The reality, though, is that for the record, I am in fact an American citizen through naturalization and I moved to the US back in 2015. So after nine years of living in the US, I hope I've got a fairly good hold on the market and the needs of many US buyers. And no, I'm not going to explain for the umpteenth time why I moved or how I'm also technically British and Canadian at the same time. That is for a, a different video. Suffice to say, when I did move to the US, I did notice some big changes in the way vehicles were treated by the average driver. And it's not just about EVs. And I think understanding this all helps us understand the differences between European and North American markets. First, while it's not just about size, size does unfortunately play a part. Anyone who has visited the US for a while will know that the cars and trucks are massive <laughs> and the size difference between the North American market and the rest of the world seems to get bigger every single year. Although there has been a general trend across the entire global automotive industry to make vehicles ever larger and ever more feature filled, it's worst here in the US where the larger is always portrayed as being the better. And there are a couple of reasons for the larger cars having to do with safety and getting around laws. So let's look at those and then we can explain why societally small cars have been consequentially frowned upon. 
More space equals more safety. At least that is what automakers like to tell you. But what isn't discussed is the fact that some US safety laws actually make it harder to build and market smaller vehicles in the US than in other countries. Take airbags, for example. In most countries around the world, airbags are designed to deploy in concert with your seatbelt tensioning itself up on impact. They are therefore treated as Supplemental Restraint Systems, or SRS, an acronym I find very amusing, rather than Primary Restraint Systems, which means that airbags aren't required to be quite as forceful when deploying as the seatbelt is assumed to be doing the heavy lifting of slowing down your body and keeping you safe. But in the US? Well, US airbag regulations assume you won't be wearing a seatbelt. As a consequence, they have to then deploy far more forcefully than their counterparts elsewhere in the world. Airbags in the US also tend to be larger than in other markets, holding more volume and exploding more viciously, although the one in the steering wheel does tend to be the same worldwide. In case you're interested, there are still US states where not wearing a seatbelt is still considered a freedom that you're allowed to partake in as a grown adult, and there are many more cases where you can't be pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt, but you could get ticketed for it if you've already been stopped for something else. And don't even get me started on motorcycle helmet law. But if you've any doubts about the differences in airbags, just look at the multiple reports that cite airbag injuries in the US. They are much, much more severe en masse and more frequent than in other parts of the world. I'll link to the studies in the down below. Add into that the fact that Americans are, on average, a little heavier and larger than many drivers in other nations, and those airbags ultimately have to work harder. But what does this have to do with smaller vehicles and, and smaller EVs? Well, if your airbags have to work harder and your passengers are larger, the vehicles tend towards larger as well, because passenger and driver comfort is a thing. So next, let's look at the laws regarding more efficient vehicles, which, since their inception in the 1970s, have been flawed. I am, of course, talking about the CAFE standards, the Corporate Average Fuel Economy Tests, which were designed after the 1970s oil crises to force automakers to make smaller, more efficient cars. And while they did, at least to some extent, use the fuel economy rules to make small, compact and subcompact cars to offset the absolutely abysmal economy of big gas guzzlers like muscle cars and 4x4s, here's the thing. Those, those cafe standards have always had an exemption based on size and weight and class. For many years, marketing a vehicle as a truck gave an automaker the idea that they could shirk fuel economy by making vehicles that were clearly designed as cars classify as trucks. And when the EPA realised its error around 2006 and designed a new method for determining fuel efficiency, it did something which on paper logically felt good, but was not. Those new rules, which came into effect in 2011, were basically a turning point for automakers that made a wide variety of models in different segments to ones that almost exclusively focused on SUVs and pickups. What was the change, you ask? The EPA decided to target a vehicle's efficiency based on its footprint. This is basically its wheelbase times its wheel track. So the smaller the resulting number, the smaller the vehicle, the higher the efficiency requirements. But the larger the number, the larger the vehicle, and the lower the efficiency requirements. And in order to work less on fuel economy and more on profits for shareholders, automakers did what automakers do. Take the easy way out and cash out. And that led to ever increasingly larger vehicles. That creep spread across the entire industry. If you want an example, just take a vehicle that was being sold new in 2006 and compare it to its nameplate sibling 18 years later, and you'll see just how large that growth in size has become. Which brings me back to safety, or rather perceived safety. Basic physics dictates larger, heavier objects will do better in a collision than a smaller, lighter object, and automakers have clued in on that in a big way. They've trained customers through careful advertising that they, the squishy bags of mostly water, will be better inside a large vehicle than a small one. I know, when dealing with cars, that logic is partly flawed because it assumes that neither vehicle has the ability to transfer energy around the passenger cell, but let's ignore that for now because it's the status quo we have 
And don't worry, I am getting back to the size thing in EVs. Promise. We've become so entrenched in the notion that larger is safer no matter what. Smaller vehicles aren't selling in the US, often because buyers are terrified of what happens when they get into an accident with a smaller vehicle. Editing Nikki from the future here, or with a hand in a splint. So between me filming and editing this, I had an accident. And I had an accident in a big vehicle, a Ford F-150 Lightning. The truck was written off. And many of you have pointed out that had I been in a smaller vehicle, I might not have survived as easily as I did. But at the same point, the weight of my F-150 Lightning sliding off the road into a power line may not have caused the power line to come down had the vehicle I was driving been smaller and lighter. And because crash tests downplay the importance of safety to people outside of the vehicle, something we have moaned about a lot on this channel, bigger is always portrayed as being better and safer. And so the relentless trinity of buyer fear, fuel economy regulation, and bigger is better continues. Smaller vehicles of any size are, in fact, often marked as not being real vehicles and woe betide anyone who considers buying a car with less than four seats. Unless it's a sports car, in which case, go right ahead. Because of everything I've detailed, small cars, electric or otherwise, aren't considered by your average North American buyer and as such, automakers are less eager to work to build and sell them here. And given the amount of money it takes to homologize a vehicle for the US market, even if it's on sale elsewhere, most automakers just don't bother. A size then is one side of the sword. And because people want larger because of everything I've just detailed, that means that when they are considering an EV, they only want EVs that are similar in size to the gasoline cars they're replacing. And larger EVs also need larger battery packs to get the same kind of range as a smaller one. And sadly, as I'll come to in a moment, whatever the actual data suggests, people view their needs as far greater than they actually are. Larger vehicles with larger, more powerful airbags and larger seats will have a larger overall weight. And to push that heavier vehicle along the ground, it needs more battery pack capacity for a given range. I just want you to think for a second of my Chevrolet Bolt EV, one of the last true small vehicles on sale in North America, at least until Fiat starts churning out the 500e. It's technically a subcompact, and the last iteration of the car came with a 66 kilowatt hour battery pack that gave approximately 250 miles of range. The car from GM that's currently going to replace it, at least for a while until GM comes out with the next generation Altium based Bolt EV, a car we already know will be bigger. The current successor is the Chevrolet Equinox EV, which in its entry level format is shooting for the same 250 mile range as the outgone Bolt, but from a much larger battery pack that we are going to guess will be about 85 kilowatt hours usable. The Equinox EV is bigger than the Bolt EV in every way. It is bigger, it's heavier, and it needs a much larger battery pack to compensate for that extra heft for exactly the same range. At this point, let's throw a bone to the fact that some of this is just about aerodynamics. The Aptera solar electric vehicle is by far physically larger than the Chevrolet Bolt and is in fact wider than a Tesla Model 3, but it's much more efficient than either because of its aerodynamic shape and its construction. But I'd also hazard a guess that most people discount it as an option because it's a weird looking two seat car rather than because it's made by a startup who has yet to reach production status. Just a guess. So far then, we've got practical and sociological reasons why people don't want small EVs or think they don't want small EVs in North America. Now let's look at the real teeth kicker, a range. Just as the age old joke about men overestimating length for certain intimate things, so too do people tend to dramatically overestimate the real world range they actually need from a vehicle. But the reality is that for the overwhelming majority of people out there, a range of more than a few hundred miles or kilometers isn't really needed. 
even in North America, like northern Canada, the plains and the west coast, where things are much further apart than they are on, say, the east coast or in Europe, the average person doesn't normally drive long distances every single day. And if they do, it's usually because they're a professional driver, they work in a job where they have to drive a lot, or they live in an extremely rural community. And if that is you, great. But you are in the minority. The overwhelming majority of people in the US and Canada live in urban areas or in the suburbs. And the majority of those drive fewer than 20 to 40 miles per day, 32 to 64 kilometres. Even a limited range EV can deal with several days of commuting at that kind of distance before it needs to be recharged. Yet... American sensibilities about the age of the automobile and how cars allow us to explore the world around us at a moment's notice and they are the pathway to freedom are all simultaneously used to prey upon us when we are buying new cars. Plug-in hybrids are especially often sold with this particular brand of hook, convincing buyers that they're the real smart ones for buying an electric car for around town, but it can still go cross-country on gasoline at the weekends. In fact, in North America, if you sell a car with a range of less than 250 miles or 402 kilometres, you're often laughed at. And if you try and sell one with a range of just 150 miles, which is 240 kilometres, despite the data I just gave you, you'll probably be chased out of town. At this point, I'm pretty sure that people watching this are yelling and screaming and pointing out that the reason you need all of this extra range is because batteries and battery health and poor charging infrastructure. And yes, a larger battery pack does put less strain on individual cells for a given power drain. But making batteries even bigger, which is what the industry has done over the last 10 years, also means the practical power drain increases because the vehicle's size and thus motor size also has to go up. And to charging? While it is fair to admit that charging networks are terribly unreliable in many parts of the world, the US transition to NEX is meant to change that. And I suspect that even if everyone did have access to a Tesla charging station every 50 miles, we'd still not see a drop in average EV range because range anxiety is a sales tool for larger vehicles and higher price tags. Is there any real practical reason why a vehicle like the Dacia Spring wouldn't sell in the US? I mean, it's small, it's practical, and it gets the job done. It's uninspiring, it's unassuming, and it costs a fraction of most US and Canadian market EVs. Well, it's also not the extension of self that many buyers are looking for in a society where cars are viewed as status symbols rather than tools. And that, I think, is the final nail in the coffin of smaller, more affordable EVs in North America. And just as many people look down on small houses and cheap clothes, so too has society locked itself into that notion that faster and quicker and more expensive is the only way. However, if we want to continue down a path where private car ownership continues, we need a change of mental state to think about more affordable, more equitable EVs. But I fear that's for a completely different video. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling right by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel every month through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can remain 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There are a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A massive welcome to our newest supporters, Carl B. Knapp, Stoyle Pankoff, Smithers, John Strott, Kelly, Joseph Valentinetti, John Flint, and Nate Fritz. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations. And we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. The address is also below. 
And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store also in the down below. This month, we're campaigning for an end to charging deserts with an amazing new t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you're subscribed on Peertube or YouTube and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video, but we think that this one is also well worth a look. See you soon and as always, keep evolving!